Rosunski is an old friend and colleague, a guy who's been in the game just as long as I have, actually a guy who's responsible for a lot of getting me into health optimization and fixing my health. So um, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Justin Marcajani to the show. He's going to share some of his expertise on specifically thyroid, but he can go deep in all kinds of different areas on functional health. Doc, welcome to the show. Hey, Dave, thanks so much. I mean, I remember years ago, you're like, hey, I'm thinking about doing this podcast thing. How should I How should I do it? And here you are, man. You're making it all happen. So love it. Love what you're doing here. This is great and excited to, to drop some serious knowledge bombs on today's podcast. This is good. Yeah, there's, there's just a ton to unpack with respect to thyroid health, especially what are some of the more functional interventions for thyroid health. I really want to go deep on that topic today. But before that, for everyone who's listening, if you've been listening to this show for quite some time, just a little bit of history with Dr. Justin and I. Dr. Justin and I first met at the one of Dave Asprey's very, very first conferences ever. Yes. So this was, I believe, 2012, and it was the very first biohacking conference Dave Asprey ever had. Now it's thousands of people, and it's in Beverly Hills and, and Florida, and it's just gone insane. But the first one Asprey ever had was in the San Francisco Tenderloin in, in the basement of a hotel. And there yes. was about 20 biohackers there. And Dr. Justin was there and he had his adjustment table out and he yes. was just, he, after, after the conference, he was just hustling. He was doing adjustments. Yeah. He was, he was like just on it. And then, uh, Doc, you were, you were practicing in Cupertino at that time yes. in the Bay Area. That's correct. And I was living in San Francisco and, I started coming to your office in Cupertino, yeah. and I, I started working on my health with you. You were really the Absolutely. first functional doctor I'd ever worked with. And what was amazing about working with Dr. Justin was he was the first person who could actually go and find all those subclinical things that needed to be addressed that every other healthcare professional I'd worked with had missed. So, for example, Justin, you identified some – issues with um, thyroid that we're going to talk about here today. I had very high levels of reverse T3, and we're going to yep. get into what that means. Now, now, why does that matter? Well, nobody I'd ever worked with medically had run a full thyroid panel. They just ran some half-assed TSH panel. So that was the yep. first thing. And then you started looking at more of the functional testing. You started looking at uh, the microbiome, and you were the first to identify that I had a gram-negative um, bacteria in my yeah. microbiome, which is not bad. We all have it. Right. But what happens is in some people, it gets out of balance relative to Bingo. other um, parts of the microbiome. And you were the first one that was able to test that and we worked on it. And all through this process, I was keeping all the, the lab test information you were running for me in a spreadsheet. And then what I did was I'm like, hey, this is pretty interesting. I went back to all my old doctors and I got all my old blood work and I added them to the spreadsheet. So now I had the data from when I was working with you. But then I also had 10 or 15 years more into the future from past doctors. And that's yes. honestly where I had the aha moment for Heads Up, which is, wow, I actually have more insight into my health than any doctor will ever have. Because all I did was put this fucking data in a spreadsheet, pardon yes. my French. Yep. And it's like, why is the system not able to do this? And I could see trends that had been going in a certain direction for 10 years. And there is zero chance that any medical professional would ever be able to see that. Not because they don't, they're not looking. It's because the system is so fragmented. I had four patient portals to log into, Quest, LabCorp, Stanford, UCSF, St. Mary's to try to cobble this data together. So before we dive into the thyroid topic, I just thought it'd be fun to reminisce a bit, Doc, about like how we first met. We were, we've been yeah. doing this biohacking thing since 2012. So mm -hmm. we're kind of like the OGs and uh, just how you actually working with you. Exactly. And then you might remember, we started even designing screens together for the app. I'm like, hey, yes. Justin, what do you think yes. about this screen for like tracking ketones? And you're like, well, you also need a, you also need to add a tag for, uh, for this, and, and that's what you want for blood glucose. And you're like, well, you need these little inf pieces of information and change it this way. So we started actually like working on some of the early user interface designs together. So um, it's, it's fun. It's been like, I don't know, man, gosh, 10 or 11 years now we've been working together. I love it, man. It's great. Time flies. This is awesome. And we're going to kind of reminisce a little bit and try to coalesce some good information to help the listeners out. So that, that's phenomenal. I love it. 
Yeah. So, you know, also, Justin, I've seen you speak at a number of conferences. I've seen you speak at Paleo FX, among yeah. other things. And you, you have an incredible amount of expertise on thyroid. Mm -hmm. And I thought we could spend some time discussing that today because Hashimoto's, Graves, uh, low energy, uh, weight gain, um, metabolic dysfunction, blood sugar dysregulation. There's so many things really that, that are all correlated and tied to optimal thyroid function, uh, autoimmune conditions, autoimmune thyroid. And, and even if you're listening and, and you've never even run a full thyroid panel on yourself and you're working on a lot of these things, it's an area that Justin has a tremendous amount of expertise on. So, Doc, maybe we could just start by having you give us a basic overview on the thyroid gland itself, what it does, what is that cascade of hormones that starts like right from the pituitary, that whole cycle, if you can break it down for us. And then let's get into like the full thyroid panel, why it's different from just looking at TSH and what tests have to be on the full thyroid panel to get a full picture of what's going on. Yeah. Awesome, man. Great question. I hit Great you hard there, Doc, with a couple yeah, of big ones right out of the gate. No, that's good. That's good. I'm excited to dive in. So, I mean, first off, I, I got a book on thyroid health coming out called The Thyroid Reboot. So my first chapter, I give that away free. So if you go to justinhealth.com, you can get access to it. I have a lot of the the lab ranges and everything there. So some awesome. of this stuff will be there. So it's kind of like, think of it as like a cliff note. So if someone wants to get access, just Yeah, we'll link to it here as well. Yeah. And we'll link to uh, that, 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 that chapter and then um, the book. Perfect. That's awesome. So, I mean, out of the gate, like thyroid health is a major issue just today in general. I think it's one out of five women have it. Um, there's an autoimmune implication that tends to get skirted over by conventional medicine because, you know, the medications to treat autoimmune conditions a lot of times are worse than the actual issue. And we still have a very antiquated way of looking at thyroid health, right? Conventional medicine looks at things from a disease-based state. They're like, all right, let's just, let's just fix the pathology so the labs don't <laughs> represent a disease pathology, but that doesn't necessarily mean you feel good, you're healthier, your energy's better, your mood's better, your hair's better. It doesn't necessarily mean that. We can get that TSH back into range, but are you really feeling better? Is that correlating with a clinical outcome? And a lot of times, no. <laughs> and so that's that's one of the big things. And also the indication, the late stage indicators like TSH, you could have a problem for five, 10 years before that even pops out of range where your doctor would even say, hey, maybe there's an issue here. And so we have one, just a philosophical disconnect, right? Function and performance over pathology and disease. And then number two is we have late stage indicators. How are we even testing this? What totally. kind of indicators are we doing to even assess function and that can pick things up before they become a problem? And then number three, I would say is, your hormones just don't, I, don't don't dysfunction in isolation, right? Everything kind of happens together. It's like a spider's web, right? You touch one part of it, it reverberates. And so when you have thyroid issues, there's a good chance there could be autoimmune. There's a good chance there could be gut. There's a good chance there could be adrenal health, nutrient deficiencies, toxicity. Of course, maybe the thyroid is the weakest link out of all of them, or maybe you have three or four equal weak links. So you have to look at everything with an open mind saying, hey, what else is going on here? Even though I resonate with all these thyroid symptoms, cold hands, cold feet, hair loss, eyebrow thinning, constipation, there could be other things also coalescing and driving that as well. And so we want to keep that open mind so we can really get to the root of what's happening. Yeah, there's a couple things that came up for you just to relate that back to some of my own mm -hmm. experience, Doc, that, that may be helpful for those listening. When I was working with you, I didn't necessarily have a lot of those symptoms, the hair loss, mm -hmm. cold hands. I was working on um, just some body composition, weight loss. But I remember when you started looking at my um, my full thyroid panel, you did indeed also find that my adrenal cortisol curve was was not good, which means when you tested the, the saliva cortisol at different points in the day, a normal curve, you wake up and your cortisol level starts going up and then towards the, the evening time, it starts winding down. So you ran the thyroid panel and the adrenal cortisol panel. You were the first one to do that. It turns out my cortisol curve was, was out of range, which indicates there was adrenal issue there, which you mentioned. And then you also ran the microbiome tests. And you were able to find that there were things in the microbiome that, that may have been causing the issue. There was, an, there was an, a stressor yeah. 
in my microbiome that may have actually been the cause of the adrenal fatigue and also the cause of like subclinical thyroid. So that's just based on my own experience. And then you also mentioned something else, which was kind of like the early check engine light. You know, oftentimes in, in a conventional diagnosis, by the time the TSH lab is out of range, you know, you've, you've already been trending in the wrong direction for five or 10 years. We do a lot in metabolic health. It reminds me a lot, Dr. J, of um, testing hemoglobin A1C or yep. actually starting to test fasting insulin, which can actually give you an indicator potentially years or decades before you get a diagnosis. So is that yeah. a similar type of um, relationship, insulin to HbA.C.? And then like some of the advanced thyroid markers to, to identify thyroid issues early. hundred percent. Yeah. That, that's a big one. I mean, you can go right now into Google, you could type in T3 and insulin resistance or T3 and just, you can look at diabetes. That'll give you the extreme, but you're going to see all kinds of impairments because when you look at thyroid conversion, there's a lot of factors that are involved in that insulin resistance, cortisol, inflammation all play a major role. Yeah. Um, you, you asked me a question last time about some of the lab markers. Let me just kind of dive back into that. I'll actually pull up my book on screen here, give you guys a little sneak peek before it goes to the editor here. All right. Are you able to see it, it yet? Jay? Yes. Are uh, you I able can. to see it? Oh, hang on. Let me just enable the screen share here. There yeah, we go. got it, Doc. Perfect. Awesome. All right. So let's dive in. Here's the content. So if you're listening, uh, we'll, we'll link to this. If, if you're watching on the screen, Justin is scrolling through some of the information that, that he presents on his website and in his book. So um, yep. take us through it, Doc. This will be the new book here that comes out. So chapter one is going to be the first one because we talk about some of the thyroid lab testing here. So let me just kind of dive into that. There's a couple yeah, of good and, and, and please mention, Doc, the difference between TSH and the full panel because I think that's really the pearl here of making sure you run the full thyroid antibodies, uh, T3, T4, reverse T3. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of my friends and family in Canada – they can't even get a reverse T3 run. They just won't run it, yeah. period. Yeah, exactly. It's it's crazy. So when we look at kind of physiology of the thyroid, right, we have brain, the brain communicating with the thyroid to actually make T4, right? Yep. So typically conventional medicine, they're only looking at this brain hormone called TSH. So they're yep. like, oh, I'm going to test my thyroid. Well, are you really testing your thyroid when you go to your conventional doctor? or are you testing a brain hormone? You're actually testing a pituitary hormone. Now that pituitary hormone is a signaling hormone. It talks to your thyroid to make T4. Here's T4 right here. It's relatively inactive. It's about three to 400% um, less active than T3. And so T4 is good to look at because if you have low T4, you're probably going to have low T3. So it's nice to see at least that component. Most are only going to run TSH. Maybe you run T4. And then we have this conversion here. And this T4 goes either to active T3 or to inactive reverse T3, okay? And so if you go back to some of your situation, you had this low level or this high level of reverse T3, this lower level of T3, and this is an important thing to look at. This can be very helpful. Well, I had a conversion issue. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. Now, there's another infographic down here that I made. Let me see if I can grab it. So I had I had normal TSH, just for everyone listening. Yep. So yep. if you just tested TSH, I would have come back in range. I had normal T4, so yep. that looked good. But then when you looked at the level of T3, I was low. And when you looked at the amount of reverse T3, I was high. So my, my T4 to T3, that step in the chain was broken. Did I, did I get that right, Doc? That, that's correct. Yep, that's correct. So then the question that you worked on with me is why? Why is that conversion not optimal? And mm -hmm. that's kind of where you and I really started our thyroid work. Yep. And here's a good infographic I made that kind of looks at a lot of the things that can impact this conversion. So we have different stressors, right, that have a major effect on thyroid activation. Cortisol, high or low. So this cortisol is a stress hormone. So if we're acutely stressed, it's good that cortisol goes up, right? That's a good thing. The question is we don't want it to stay up where we're anxious, tired but wired, can't sleep, excessively sweaty, our sympathetic nervous system, our limbic systems in overdrive. So cortisol is a big one. There's different nutrients. So if we have selenium issues or anemia, anemia could be low iron, low B12, because we're maybe we have gut issues, dysfunction. Maybe we're vegan or vegetarian. Maybe we have mm -hmm. low selenium right? Maybe we're not breaking down and ionizing our selenium. We could have insulin resistance. We could have gut issues, inflammation. We could have gut bugs or gut permeability. Maybe we're not eating enough protein. I mean, the back, the backbone of a thyroid hormone is actually tyrosine, which is a protein. And so all of these things, you know, heavy metals, you could throw mold in there with females, low progesterone is a big deal as well. So all these are factors that can impact, you know, thyroid conversion. So when you go to your conventional doctor and they're like, yeah, your TSH is okay. Well, is that enough? It's more than likely it's not enough. 
And then the question is, even if you run a full panel, you still have to look at it with the mindset of like, all right, which one of these things could be active? What, what do we have to dive into next? Does that make sense? That's exactly what I was hoping to get into. That kind of maps back to my own experience as well. I had to start looking at a lot of those things. I wasn't supplementing at all with um, B-Complex. Turns out I needed to because mm -hmm. of a methylation issue. That yep. was, um, I figured out later. Selenium, that's something that you had me add to my supplement stack. I still take it yep. today. Um, iodine, I do take a, a little bit of that in, in the stack. Uh, insulin resistance, when I was working with you, Justin, at that time, yep. I had no idea what it meant to check my blood sugar. I had always been young and healthy and, and fit. And I'm like, check my blood sugar. You mean like stick my finger and get a drop of blood and like – but actually, that is probably one of the most profound things I've learned on the journey because understanding which foods send your blood sugar off to the stratosphere and which foods actually keep your blood sugar in check, that is a massive game changer, not only for thyroid health, but just for sleep and weight loss. So uh, insulin resistance, I had some early signs of that just from being ignorant to it, quite honestly. And then gut, we already mentioned, I had some issues there. Make sure I'm getting enough protein. Yep. That's just really, really easy to overlook. So I guess once you figure out that some of these lab ranges are not right, that's where the functional expertise comes in and you start the diagnostic process. It's, it's probably one or more of these things that all need to be addressed. And the thing with the functional approach is when you're working on these things like insulin resistance and micronutrient deficiency, they don't just fix, you know, the day after you start taking the supplement, Un unlike a, a, a pharmaceutical, which, which can have very, very fast acting effects, these types of things, they, they can take months, sometimes years to fix. Is that accurate? hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, these things, you know, didn't happen in a day. A lot of times these problems have been going on probably for a decade before you even noticed it. And so here's yep. a graphic that I just put into the book here. Now, uh, I have some of these images pulled out because when you're, when you're doing book editing, it's a pain in the butt to put color images it just makes your book go up like three times in cost and everything and so yep. i'm trying to get a lot of these things converted to black and white but i just pasted this in here i think it's helpful so just kind of looking at things right we have brain signaling is the starting the first domino imagine like a domino rally right so the yep. first domino is our brain tsh yep. it yep. talks to our thyroid and so things that can impact your brain that things that can impact or get in the way of that first domino inflammation so autoimmunity toxicity Exposure to pesticides, heavy metals, right? Uh, mold toxins, stress, cortisol. These things can impact that signaling, and we can have what's called HPT axis dysfunction. That just means hypothalamus pituitary thyroid dysfunction. Think of it as you go to your thermostat. It's hot as heck out. You're trying to turn the thermostat down and get the AC on, but imagine the heat kicks on, right? So you kind of have the, the signals or the wires are crossed to the HVAC and to the furnace. That's yep. what's happening here. Next, we have our thyroid it does a couple of things here. It actually can make T4. That T4 can be converted to T3 at that thyroid. That's your active thyroid hormone, about 20%. And then we have issues in the liver. And so the liver is really important because the liver makes the 5 deiodinase enzyme that's selenium-based to help with the conversion of T4 to T3. That enzyme is a deiodinase enzyme. What does deiodinase mean? It means it takes off one iodine. So you have T4, that just means tyrosine and four iodines. It pulls off one of those iodines, now it's T3. So the, the T4 and the T3, it corresponds to how many numbers of iodine are there. This starts the activation process. And so when you talked about having reverse T3 issues or, or a lot of stress, right, that's a big component is the liver because that helps that enzyme to activate your thyroid hormone. Yeah, that makes total sense. And, and I didn't, I was, again, I was working for a huge tech company. I had a really fast paced career. I was going out on the weekends with my friends, partying hard, and uh, I didn't have a good handle on unhealthy diet. I didn't, again, I was, this was before I'd started my journey. I didn't know what it meant to eat in ways that were healthy on blood sugar. I definitely was in what I would call a, a very high stress state just in the job that I was in. It was extremely stressful. And I started, that's when I first even started learning how to, to practice meditation. And I remember when I started practicing meditation, I would just sit for like 15 minutes at home before bed. And it was just, it was profound change, actually. And that's, that's when I started learning how to, how to learn how to downregulate my own stress. And that's when I learned how to 
not just with meditation, but other things that were really helpful for stress, just like being outdoors more, uh, spending time with friends and family. I started uh, yep. practicing uh, hot yoga, which is intense, but it was actually very, it, it helped with a lot of the, just the physical tension in my body, the muscle tension, because uh, I was lifting heavy weights and, and being super physically active. So getting into the whole stress management part of it is another another thing that's been hugely important for me. When, when you're working with clients, Doc, and you suspect that there's an emotional stressor, work, life, family, uh, how do you make recommendations there? It's obviously different than an environmental or a chemical stressor. Any recommendations on, on that part of it? Yeah. So when I always do my intake with patients, I always like to get a surveillance of what's happening emotional, emotional stress wise. Mm -hmm. And so the big mm -hmm. ones are going to be, is there work stress? Is there financial yeah. stress? Is there marital stress? Is mm -hmm. there issues with the kids or just kind of the family unit or just kind of satisfaction or purpose in your life? I just yeah. try to get kind of a surveillance of, you know, survey the landscape and see what's an issue, what's not. Everyone's going to have stress. The question is, are you managing it? And so if patients are like, yeah, you know, there's some issues here or there, but we're on top of it. We're functional. We're doing good. Nothing. I'm not sweeping any dirt underneath the carpet. I feel good. If there mm -hmm. is issues going on, someone's in the middle of a divorce. Maybe there's lots of, you know, crippling debt. Maybe they hate their job. Well, it's like, all right, we just have to get really clear on what our goals are. Right. And we have to make sure that we at least are doing one to two different things to fix the problem. Our brains it's a good way are, to look at it. They, they will. It's like, you know, it was tax week, I think, earlier in the week. Right. April 15th. Right. Tax day. Right. If I ignored filing my taxes and paying my taxes, my brain would chip away at me and keep me up at night because of the stress and the consequence that could happen. And so your brain's not going to stop until you start doing stuff. Hey, reach out to your bookkeeper, reach out to your CPA. It's trying to get you to take action and it will create anxiety and stress until you are motivated to do it. And so just make sure that you're taking some action to neutralize these issues. And so I just say, write down the big three to five issues. Make sure you write down one to two steps that you are actively pursuing to neutralize that. That gets the limbic system off your back. And then you start to feel like you're getting momentum on that. And then, of course, you can do yeah. extra, you know, stress management things, whether it's, you know, meditation, prayer, gratitude, you know, EFT. Go your to EMDR, the spa, this, you know, like yeah, just, just uh, even, even for the fellows out there, just go to the spa. They got like hot tub, cold plunge, infrared cold sauna, plunge. you yeah. know, just take a couple hours there. Yeah. And, and it's I, important I tell patients. To, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I want to emphasize emotional stress as a, a potential impact on thyroid function. I don't think enough people make the connection between something like work stress and how that can affect your body's own chemistry. So that's just like the one connection point I want to make here is mm -hmm. understanding that just purely stress can dysregulate this whole chemical process that Dr. Justin is explaining here. Yep. A hundred percent. And I always tell patients, the healthier you are, the more resistant to stress you are. And so, yeah, you yeah. can have stressors, but the healthier you are, the more you'll be able to deal with it and adapt to it. It's totally. just the, the stress that's high level and it's unresolved and it's things you are not taking action on. That's where it gets a little bit concerning. So as long as you're taking action or if you're in the middle of a divorce, hey, our expectations are going to be down-regulated because stress is really high. Totally. And it's so, like, okay, but I'm in a stressful period yeah. for the next three months. All right, yeah. it's fine. Let's deal yeah. with it. I'll make sure I put all deal my support it. structure in place. But then yeah. when that stress ends, your body should be able to bounce back to where yeah. it was before. But the healthier, yep, bingo. But the healthier you are, the more you're going to be able to adapt to what's happening. Love it. And so just kind of looking at this last part here, I didn't write, quite go into it, but the reason why we have all these conversion issues, cortisol imbalances, guess what? That's going to be a big component of stress because what's happening when you're stressed, lots of cortisol, lots of adrenaline, it can deplete neurotransmitters, it can deplete a lot of nutrients. You can open up Guyton's physiology textbook, right? And you'll see when you're stressed, you're dumping lots of B vitamins and potassium out your kidneys. That's part of what's happening during stress. So you lose nutrients during stress. So the more stressed you are, the more you have to have your diet and nutrition and supplementation on because you're just, you have an expensive transaction fee, so to speak. Hey, you know, that reminds me, Doc, there was another lab test I ran when I was working with you. It was called homocysteine. And that's yep. another one of these labs that, that it's very hard to get your conventional medicine doctor to run. Anecdotally, I remember that I got my, one of my um, integrative doctors to run it. And I went to LabCorp and ran it. And LabCorp sent me a bill for $350 <laughs> for a homocysteine <laughs> test. And then I went on the LabCorp website and I could buy the same test for $70. 
and my insurance company billed me 350. I'm like, Hey, shouldn't, shouldn't the rate that my insurance company gets be lower than what you get off the street? That's when you realize how fucked up the system is. Uh, anyhow, um, Oh, Almost the system 15, is totally jacked up. Yep. It was out of range high mm-hmm. for me. And mm-hmm. and you said, hey, Dave, this is probably related to um, B vitamin deficiency. Yep. And so yep. I, you gave me a couple different B vitamin complexes yep. to try. Ultimately, yep. it took a combination of a couple of the right B vitamin supplements. Right now, just for those listening, I use um, the Quicksilver methylfolate. It's a sublingual. And then I use yep. another uh, one that's in a pill format uh, from um, Designs for Health. And and that combination gets my homocysteine down in range. So um, that's, I think, Love you know, that. I saw in my own physiology, the B12 deficiency. It showed yep. up in, in a homo- elevated homocysteine value, among yep. other things. And, and then conventional medicine, when they look at that, here's how they look at it. Oh, you have a, a B vitamin potential issue? Let's just run a serum B12. Well, that's probably not going to show up anything until you have – you know, unless you're extremely vegan, vegetarian, or have a lot of gut issues, uh, irritable mm-hmm. bowel disease, those kind of things. So you have serum B12 on one side, and then you have things like homocysteine, methylmalonic acid, or transholocobalamin that are yeah, much yeah. better markers that are more yeah, sensitive to pick these things up. Yeah. yeah, and then you could even put fig glue into that same can, for aminoglutamate. So we can run some of these markers that will pick some of these things up even ahead of time. Now, I just wanted to hit real quick here, just some of the markers that we were talking about. You asked me some of the lab markers. So I'll put this yeah, on the screen Yeah, what's the full again. thyroid panel? That, yeah. That's, I think, what we should get into. What's yeah. on it? There's like 12 yeah. or 14, if I'm not yep. mistaken, that are on the full panel. Yeah, I'll give you that. Approve me to add that to your thing. Do you see it there? Oh, yeah, I see it. Dog. Hang on. Yep. I'm going to add it back in here. There you go. Okay. So first thing here, TSH, right? That's the brain hormone. Yep, that one's the, standard. The standard range is about 0.5, right? I do about 0.5 to 2.5. That's a more sensitive marker. The American... Clinical Endocrinology Society says anything above 2.5 starts to become a little bit problematic. So TSH, that's the brain hormone. That's here, okay? Yep. Now we go to T4. Now, free is always the most important. For a first-timer, you can come in and run T4 free and total. That's totally fine. Total is going to look at the overall output. So my range is 6 to 10 on that, MG to DL. Conventional medicine is a little bit wider. And so that's good to look at, at least six, all right? Now, on the free, I like to be at 1, one to, one, one to 1. 1.5 NG per DL is ideal, okay? That's good. This is your relatively inactive thyroid hormone. T4 still has roles in the body for brain health and, and bone, but 1 to 1. 1.5. But really, T3 is going to be the thing, the next most important one. We have some indirect markers here like FTI, not really important. Get the first chapter of the book. You can see it. T3, same kind of thing. We have T3 total. This is going to be our overall kind of glandular output. This is about 100% of what's produced. And then we have, guess what? T3 free. That's going to be the more active. 2 to 5% of your hormones actually free. The other 95 to 98% are protein bound. So again, ideal healthy range is about 3 to 4.2. Standard range is a little bit wider, 2 to 4.4. So we want to be in that middle quintile to upper 25% quintile is, is a good place to be. And on the T3 total, about 100 to 160 is pretty good to be. That's excellent. Now, looking down below, there's T3 uptake. Again, I don't typically worry about this. If your T3 free is pretty good, it's good, nice to have. We have reverse T3. It's another good marker. I, I T3 Reverse T3 can be important to look at, especially when T3 free is, is low. So reverse T3, when T3 free is low, I'm like, all right, why is it low? Do we have a reverse T3 issue? Do we just have a conversion issue? We're not really converting much T4 to T3 in general. Forget reverse yep. T3. That was so me. When, you have, when you have conversion issues, it's good to know. When when this is high, it tells me a potential stress response is going on. And that the first T3. Yeah. I was pushing yep, it too hard. Mm-hmm. Training yep. too hard in the gym, too much yep. stress at work, going out on the weekends. You know, it was just like, it was all compounding. Yeah. And so kind of right here, it talks about it. Reverse T3 binds into the thyroid receptor site, just like T3, without the same metabolic response. So it's like putting a blank in a real gun. You pull the trigger, there's a loud noise, but there's no bullets. It's mm-hmm. taking the, the, the place of the real metabolically active hormone. And then we have our antibodies, antibodies, thyroglobulin antibody, and then we have TPO antibody down here below. These are the most common ones to look at Hashimoto's. So anything above 15 or so or above 0.9 or so on the thyroglobulin antibody could be problematic. We have thyrobinding globulin. This is a little bit – this is a lot of times going to be looked at when um, when there I think is – let's see here. This thyroglobulin, this is going to be 
looked at more for like cancer and things like that. And then thyroid binding globule, and that can go up when there's binding issues. So when there's a lot of hormones, you see it in women with birth control pills or extra exogenous hormones, those can significantly impact those things or even, you know, PCOS and such. So those are the big markers that kind of they are out of the gate. And now functionally, I'll, I'll run temperature testing along with that to see how the physiology, because we know the thyroid plays a major role with the metabolism. And so it's nice to correlate that with body temperature because metabolism and body temperature are equally connected. So it's nice to look at one, what the patient's symptoms and presentations are, yep. hair loss, cold hands, cold feet, fatigue. Two, look at the actual lab markers. And then three, try to find some subjective, objective, middle ground marker of their physiology, which is we body temperature. Yeah, I remember you talking about basal body temperature, which is yep. very different from just te checking your temperature. For example, when you get the thermometer out of the uh, medicine cabinet and check it. Basal means you check it. Well, you can explain it, Doc. Can you explain the difference between basal and, and a regular just middle of the day temperature check? Yeah, ideally, you're going to do it before you get up, before you start getting active. Right in bed, around, before you even get out of right bed. Right in bed. Yeah, and I just use a digital fertility thermometer. I used to use some of the mercury thermometers. Those were great, but then you get every now and then a patient drops it, spills it, and then you I did mercury that. everywhere. I spilled the mercury everywhere. <laughs> I know. So that's why I'm like, all right, just go to like the certified digital fertility ones that'll go to the tenth of a point. Do you have a link, then, Doc, you can share with one that you recommend? Yes, I do. I do. All right. All right. We'll put that in here as well. Yeah, I think it's justinhealth.com thermometer, justinhealth.com thermometer. I'll put the link Yeah, so you just that. get the thermometer yeah. before you get out of bed. You, you do take right a couple minute reading and that's your basal temperature before you've actually gotten out of bed to do anything. Yep, that's the one that I like right there. Uh, digital thermometer reading. I'll put it in the chat here, but that's just a yeah. good one that I like. As yeah, well. throw it in the chat and I'll, I'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, that's perfect. Yep, that's a good one. I like it. But anything that goes to the 100th degree, super, you know, precision, you know, accurate like that. Now, with women, you got to be a little bit careful on it because, you know, the first five to six days of your cycle are going to be the best time to test it. Once a woman starts getting in the middle part of their cycle, there's going to be about a 0.3 degree bump due to ovulation. So two to six is going to be the best. But once they hit the ovulation to the second half of their cycle, there will be a big temperature bump. And so if you're testing there, you could get a false high reading saying you're okay. So just in females, that first week of the cycle is going to be the most accurate on that front. Awesome. Okay. So I hope that makes sense in that one. It does. Now um, let's try to uh, round it out here, doc. So yeah, if you're listening and You've never had a full thyroid panel, even if you're generally healthy. I think it's good to get a full thyroid panel just so you have mm -hmm. baseline data. You know, there may Absolutely. be nothing wrong, but you know, three, five, ten years from now, you've got baseline data on all of the tests that Dr. Justin mentioned. For those in the United States, it's actually pretty easy to order your own labs now. So if you have a medical doctor that won't run the full panel for you, you can just go online and pay cash for it. I think even Quest and LabCorp, Ulta Labs is another one we use. Uh, get a full thyroid panel, get your baseline data. And then if you're working on any type of, um, some of the symptoms Doc, Dr. Justin mentioned, hair loss, cold hands, you know, fatigue, weight gain, uh, fingernails, uh, or just you want to, you're a biohacker and you want to fully optimize every shred of performance, full thyroid panel will be the way to go. Doc, uh, when is your book going to drop? Because you're the master. I've seen a lot of presentations on this. You break it down better than anybody. So when when can we uh, get access to your resource? Yeah, absolutely. The book will be coming out sometime this summer or fall. I'm just going through the last little bit to editing. The problem with writing a book, it's never good enough. You go through it. Yeah. You're like, okay, not anymore. It's the same building your own something. software, Doc, by the way. Oh, it's just, it's just crazy because it's just like, it's never good enough, never good enough. And I probably will never go and like write it, write it myself again. I will just hire someone to do it for me so I can just like totally be detached. You get but too attached to it. You, you got to you gotta put like your baby, baby out there at some point and, and say, exactly. it, it might be ugly. And you know what? Then you iterate on it. So um, it's different with a book, you know, with, with software, like with heads up, we can put it out. Okay. That, that, that user experience sucks and we can go back and quickly iterate it. Uh, not so with a book, so I can understand the need to want to get it just perfect. 
Exactly. So I'll put here a couple things here. I got some options here for people to get thyroid tests done. I'll put some links here. I have my abridged thyroid test, which I, I do for patients that already kind of know where they're at, that doesn't have yep. the um, the total thyroid hormones. And then I have my complete one. I'll put the link here for you guys here. They'll be in the back of the book. I kind of saw how Tim Ferriss did it where he had like recommended links at the end of four hour body. I'm like, I'm going to do it like that. So there's good resources there. So yeah. People and Dr. Get Justin access, can also, um, pe people can consult with you as well. Justin yeah. health. If you want to get a full breakdown, yep. Dr. J can help you there. And of course, if you need the best app on the market to help you track all your lab tests over weeks, months, years, decades, uh, measure basal body temperature, track sleep quality, blood sugar, that's heads up health. So doc, I think what I'm creating at heads up is really a good compliment to what you're creating. People can have all of their blood tests, not just the ones from the doctor they're working with today. Once you actually take the time to get your labs organized, you'll be able to see trends and, and, and things that, most doctors will never see just because they don't have all the data. So heads up and Dr. Justin's thyroid protocol match made in heaven. Hey doc, in closing I here, love I want I want to ask you I a question it. that we often ask some of our guests here. And uh, that question would be in Dr. Justin's opinion, what are the top three health metrics that you pay attention to? Yeah, I think the number one thing is your functional glucose tolerance test. That's probably one of the best things you can look at because it shows how your body is dealing with your actual food, your meal. Like, what does that look like? You, you know, you before you go a meal, yeah. how's your blood sugar? Maybe even so you have test a fasting before insulin. you go eat. I remember you told me yep. this. You said, Dave, go eat your favorite breakfast. I don't care what it is. Yep. Bacon and eggs, Denny's. I don't yep. care. Test your blood sugar before. Yep. One, two, and three hours after. Is that right? Yep. That, that's correct. And then you want to see how your body responds to that meal. So you kind of come into it. You, you get a fasting. Maybe Hopefully you're below 100 at your fasting reading. You do a one hour, two hour, three hour. Ideally, we don't want to be above 140. There's some data in the literature that you have glycation and oxidative damage at the organ level above 140. We know above 170, you start to pee it out in the kidneys. So that's major kidney stress. That's the reason why 80% of kidney tr transplants and kidney disease happens to diabetics because blood sugar is really, really hard on the kidneys when it gets high. If two, we want to be below 120, maybe even below 100 in hour two, right? And definitely below 100 in hour three. And we can get a, a simple glucose monitor. I have one right here. Keto Mojo is a great one because it looks at ketones as well. And you have an yeah. integration for Or you go with one of these. I got the CGM. Yeah. Right here. And the next one here, Iratia Freestyle Libre 3. <laughs> and, and again, Always on I'm per not, point there, dog. Yeah. You got it. I'm not sure. I'm trying to figure out where I want to put it on. I, I feel like it's better on the outside of the bicep. Versus on the back? I don't know. Do you have any opinion? I like it on the back because uh, you can look cool and you can do a little yeah. tricep flex. Yeah, a little tricep. And, uh, yeah. yeah just, it's a low-key <laughs> flex when you're showing people your yes. glucometer. <laughs> yes, that's awesome. I love okay, that. Okay, functional yeah, glucose cool. tolerance test. That's one. Yep. Yep. I think that's number one. Um, and then number two, I would say add the insulin in there. Add, add just your general inflammation markers. And so with inflammation markers, I would be looking at CRP, HSCRP. Yeah. Regular okay. CRP won't test below two, two or three sometimes. Okay. So I like HSCRP so you can see exactly your number, 0.5. I want to blow one. I would say in today's day and age with inflammation, I would also want to throw on there uh, homocysteine. I kind of put that in the inflammatory camp. Homocysteine is a metabolite that will increase when you have inadequate levels of B vitamins. And then you get this metabolite homocysteine, which is very inflammatory. Also, if you have MTHFR issues and you're getting folate, folic acid from junky refined foods, processed sodas and drinks and breads, that's a problem. I would say next, I want to look at fibrinogen. I want you only to get three, you got, you, got it, you, got it, you got to narrow it down. So, so you got functional so, so glucose I, I tolerance, would, you got CRP, yep. you get one more. So I would put like my inflammation bucket. So in the inflammation bucket, I'd put CRP, homocysteine, D-dimer. Are you you're cheating, but we'll allow it. We'll allow it. <laughs> I, got okay. a, I got a big bucket. It's a, it's, I a didn't big, say, it's a big 10 here. All right, we'll allow it. Continue. So you got functional glucose tolerance. You got an inflammation bucket, an inset yeah. bucket. You mentioned yeah. HSCRP. So HSCRP, um, homocysteine, homocysteine D-dimer. I want to make sure blood flow, clotting, all these things are dialed in because that, that's a big concern. I'm seeing a lot more clotting issues today uh, and a lot more inflammation on that side. So I want to make sure that's fully dialed in and rectified as well. Okay. Third bucket. Uh, third bucket, I think gut is really important. Lots of people have – um, gut issues, whether it's absorption, whether it's inflammation due to bacterial overgrowth, SIBO, gut bugs, fungal overgrowth, parasites, H. pylori. And I want to make sure gut function is optimal. One, that's yeah. where you absorb all your nutrients. So if you're eating a, a really great diet, well, are you 
getting those nutrients absorbed. And number two, Absolutely. 80% of your immune system is there. And so if you have immune stressors and your gut's jacked up, well, one of the first things you can do to have a healthier immune system, that means stronger immune system with colds and flus and viruses, but also allergies. Not having an overreactive immune system is get your gut looked at and fully dialed in. Awesome, man. Well, uh, Dr. Justin is uh, the functional thyroid master, and we're very grateful for him coming here to share his expertise. Doc, we've got links to all of the uh, lab tests, products, uh, the new book coming out. Congrats on that. When it, when it hits, I know it will be awesome. And I know that uh, you at, at Justin Health, you just – you, you pump out tons of amazing content. So you can check out uh, Justin on YouTube and uh, all the platforms out there. He's constantly putting out just like super high quality information. He's one of the best I've worked with just in terms of his breadth of expertise. So uh, Doc, I know we've been, we've been working together for 10 or 11 years. Uh, yes. Hopefully in another 10 or 11 years, we'll be on another podcast, maybe with a few more gray hairs, yes. but, uh, yes. but, we'll, but we'll, still, we'll still be going. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, chapter nine, putting it all together, I have you there, Heads Up Health, and the links there to help manage a lot of the labs and kind of tra track everything and keep track of it. So that's that's in my book. You made chapter nine, man. Hey, you know, one other one other shout out to Dr. Justin. When I was in the early days of building Heads Up Health and I was broke, uh, he, he let me he let me crash at his place at Paleo <laughs> in yes. Austin. <laughs> yes. Excellent, man. Yeah. Good times, brother. Very good. Yeah. Well, thanks for putting this information out. Hopefully it coalesces with everyone well. And then justinhealth.com, you can access the first chapter. Also, if you want to dive in, I have a podcast and a YouTube channel, do a lot of live stuff and see patients kind of worldwide on the telemedicine, functional medicine side. So if you want to reach out, there's links there where you can do so. Awesome, Doc. Have a great day, brother. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.